Hello everyone. There is a story about two brothers who lived on adjoining farms. The brothers, who were normally on good terms for many years, fell out over an inheritance and had since stopped speaking to each other. There was nothing but bitterness between them. One morning, one brother named John answered a knock at his door. It was a carpenter who asked John if there was any work to do. John replied that there was something he could do, and then led the carpenter to where the two properties met, and showed him how the other brother had created a creek where the meadow used to be. John said, I know my brother did this to make me angry. I want you to help me get even with him by building a high fence so I won't have to see him or his property ever again. The carpenter agreed and started to work immediately. By evening, when John came to check the work, he was shocked that the carpenter had not followed his instructions. Using his skill, the carpenter had built a bridge over the creek instead of a fence. In spite of his utter shock and disappointment, John was walking down to take a look at the bridge. And as he did, the other brother too was walking down the bridge. He was quite moved that his brother had done such a wonderful thing. Subsequently, the two brothers met in the middle, looked at each other, and then held each other in a tender embrace. There were no words exchanged. And then, as they were walking in complete silence to their farmhouse, they saw the carpenter packing his tools and asked him to stay for a while to do more work for them. The carpenter replied, I am sorry, I can't stay. I have many other bridges to build. Having said that, the carpenter left. Friends, the Bible contains many wonderful stories like these. In fact, they are much more than stories. They aren't made-up stories. They really happened. Remember the amazing story about a man named Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph was the eleventh and most loved son of Jacob, also known as Israel, and the first son of his beloved second wife, Rachel. Friends, according to the book of Genesis, years after Joseph was sold into slavery, he was falsely accused of attempted rape and imprisoned. While languishing in prison, Joseph used his God-given gift of interpretation of dreams to help his prison mates. Eventually, Joseph had an opportunity to interpret Pharaoh's dream of an impending famine in Egypt and, in turn, was released and given a position of power in the land. During the seven years of famine, he was responsible for rationing grain to the Egyptians and to outsiders who came seeking help. When Joseph's brothers also went down to buy grain, Joseph recognized them but did not reveal his identity to them immediately. Friends, Having suffered so much from the atrocities and wickedness of his brothers, he would have been justified to take revenge, but he held no anger, hatred or resentment toward them. He forgave them. Eventually, the family got reunited in Egypt. Friends, although Joseph had already forgiven them, his brothers feared that he would harm them after their father died. But Joseph comforted and reassured them that God would be their judge, and he also told them that while they meant evil against him, the Lord used it for good in order to save many starving people. Friends, these stories teach us so many important truths, such as the need for reconciliation and peace in life, the role of forgiveness in achieving them, the work of peacemaking, and so on. Friends, 
In today's reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, we read Paul's instruction regarding our need for reconciliation with God and our role in making the reconciliation. Although the instruction was primarily intended for the Christians living at Corinth around 56 AD, it is meant for all believers of all ages throughout the centuries and in all parts of the world. Friends, today we shall take this instruction as though Paul is directly addressing us. First, Paul tells us who we Christians are already. He tells us that we are a new creation. Friends, what does he mean that a Christian is a new creation? In the verses preceding today's text, Paul writes, Christ has died for all, therefore all have died. He died for all so that those who live may live no longer for themselves but for him who died and rose again for them. Friends, here all does not refer to all mankind, but all who died in Christ or with Christ on the cross, meaning all who died to sin. Because Jesus died to sin, those who believe in him have died to sin as well. And Paul states further that when the believers are raised with Jesus from the death of sin to a life of righteousness, they become new creation and no longer live just to please themselves but to live for Christ. Secondly, Paul tells us, the old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Friends, what Paul is saying here is that the human pride, love of sin, dependence on our own works, our former sinful thoughts, ideas, habits, wants and ways, which we inherited from the first human beings, Adam and Eve, and were buried with Jesus. But now, as Jesus was given life, we also have been given new life through him. Thirdly, Paul wants us to know that the new birth, a new life, a new creation is a gift from God. In other words, we did not inherit the new nature or decide to recreate ourselves anew, but God himself has made us anew. As John in his Gospel writes, it is brought about by the will of God. Fourthly, Paul says, God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of salvation. Friends, to understand the words, we must first examine the use of the word reconciliation. The Greek words, the noun, katalage, meaning reconciliation, and the verb, katalaso, meaning to reconcile, rarely appear in the New Testament. Only Paul has used the word both in the noun form and the verb form in a couple of passages in his writings including five times in this short passage. Friends, what is reconciliation? In accounting, reconciliation is the process of ensuring the accuracy and validity of two sets of records. In ancient Greece, the usage of the term reconciliation was non-religious. That is to say, the word was never used in cultic context where people had the practice of making offerings and sacrifices to appease gods or to expiate their guilt. It was only used to describe the process of two people restoring their broken relationship. Friends, Paul employed this word to describe the reconciliation between God and man or the restoration of the divine human relationship. But in God's reconciliation with man, Paul makes four things clear. 1. God initiated the reconciliation with mankind. It was wholly his initiative and plan to save us from the power of sin. 2. 
God made the reconciliation possible only through the teaching, suffering, death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. 3. God reconciled himself to us, his enemies, while we were still in hostility or remained in our sinful state. He treated us as though we were innocent. 4. God has commissioned us to share the message with others, particularly non-believers, that they also can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. In this way, Paul says that we become ambassadors for Christ. Friends, what is an ambassador? The Greek word for ambassador is presbyo. That literally means an elderly person or a mature person. For instance, in the parable of the prodigal son in today's gospel, the word is used as the title for the elder son or elder brother. Friends, it is believed that in the ancient Greek culture, it was the elder son or elder brother's job to keep the family together. In ancient Greece, the same word presbyo was also used as ambassador and had the same meaning as it has today. Friends, an ambassador can be defined as an official envoy or a representative of a nation in a foreign land. It is of utmost importance that ambassadors uphold the dignity and image of the countries they represent and that they carry themselves in a manner that will not dent their country's reputation but rather uplift it. Similarly, Paul holds that we Christians as ambassadors for Christ are not just given the task of sharing the message of reconciliation with others, but also must show the same characteristics or qualities of ambassadors. We must be mature people whose life reflects well on our Lord Jesus Christ. We must stand and represent him in this lost world, and it is a huge responsibility. That is why Paul is delivering that message as though God were pleading through us. Friends, if you are to go into the world of lost brothers and sisters and tell them that reconciliation to God is available to them through his son Jesus Christ, Paul stresses that first and foremost we must be reconciled to God. We must not forget that Christ who was holy, righteous, and perfectly sinless, became sin, not a sinner, but a sin offering, a sacrifice for sin, so that we might become God's righteousness in Him. Friends, how can we reconcile to God? 1. Just as we heard in the first story today, our pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, sloth, and other evil thoughts and deeds have created a rift between us and our Creator God. Recognizing our inability to bridge the gap, God Himself has made a way for us. He has made the bridge, that is, His Son Jesus Christ, in order that we all might get to Him. Friends, for God so loved the world that He gave His Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus has become the bridge for us through His sacrifice and death on the cross and resurrection. He is the way, but the choice is ours. We have to make a personal choice to walk across the bridge that God has provided for us. So, we must believe in the power of the cross of Christ and start walking towards Him so as to receive his free gift of salvation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, acceptance of the gift of salvation in Christ enables us not only to live more peacefully here on earth, but also to live eternally in heaven. 2. As we seek reconciliation and peace with God, we must also encourage others, both believers and non-believers, to seek reconciliation with God. In other words, 
we must act as ambassadors of God's reconciliation. However, as we share God's message of reconciliation that is available through Jesus Christ, we must also try to live out his message by seeking reconciliation with friends and families, even if it isn't our fault. Friends, like Joseph in the Old Testament story, each one of us must seek out the appropriate words and ways to reconcile with others. Moreover, remember, our Lord God has shown the greatest example of humility. Just as he has forgiven us unconditionally in Christ, so as to accomplish reconciliation, we must forgive others unconditionally and be reconciled. Friends, we must be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgives us. May the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Amen. God bless you.